President-elect Joe Biden is under pressure from some in his party to reform what's known as the filibuster in the Senate. A memo from several progressive groups released Monday calls on Mr. Biden to alter or remove it completely. They argue it would make passing a coronavirus relief plan easier and warn Democrats will be judged in the midterms on whether they, quote, deliver tangible results that improve Americans' lives. Even with control of the Senate split evenly, the filibuster allows lawmakers from either party to block or delay a vote on legislation by effectively burying it in endless debate. President-elect Biden has signaled an openness to reforming that. For more on this, let's bring in Adam Gentleson. He is author of the book Kill Switch, The Rise of the Modern Senate and the Crippling of American Democracy. He also served as Deputy Chief of Staff to Democratic Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. Adam, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Before we get into this push for reforms, give us some background. When and why was the filibuster first used, and what is its connection uh, to opposition to civil rights? So uh, two, two things I want uh, your viewers to understand about the filibuster. One is, uh, even though it's one of the things we associate directly with the Senate today, uh, it was not a part of the original Senate. Uh, it was not intended to be a part of the Senate. Uh, the framers were very clear about this. Um, they had just seen the Articles of Confederation happening before the Constitution. <clears throat> And the Articles of Confederation were a disaster because they had a supermajority threshold. So the framers were very clear that they wanted the Senate to be a majority rule body. The filibuster didn't come into existence until about 50 years later in the middle of the 18th century. And it was directly connected to preserving slavery. Uh, its chief innovator was John C. Calhoun, uh, sort of the grandfather of the Confederacy, a senator from South Carolina, uh, who argued on the Senate floor that slavery was a positive good. Uh, and he invented the filibuster in large part to empower uh, a minority of senators uh, to stop the march of abolition and try to preserve slavery. Uh, that d direct connection to uh, racism continued on into the 20th century when the filibuster was strengthened into the supermajority threshold that we know it today, requiring everything to pass uh, 60 votes in the Senate. Uh, and that strengthening was done by Southern segregationist senators uh, who were out to preserve Jim Crow. And from the end of Reconstruction all the way up until Lyndon Johnson passed the first major civil rights bill in 1964, uh, the only issue that the filibuster was used to kill was civil rights. So uh, that uh, legacy of racism is something that we really have to take into consideration uh, when we're discussing the filibuster, because a lot of that uh, 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 history uh, continues in, in the way that it's applied today. And Adam, how has the filibuster impacted actual political debate and accountability? And can it kill bills even when they have broad support? Yes, it absolutely can. One of the examples that I discuss in the book, uh, which occurred while I was in the Senate, was when uh, the, the filibuster killed uh, a very moderate, uh, common sense policy response to the Newtown shootings and the massacre of 20 first graders there. Uh, you know, in response to that shooting, uh, a Democratic senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, joined with a Republican senator from Pennsylvania, Pat Toomey, two senators who could not have been more different. Uh, they came up with a very moderate, common sense approach of expanding background checks, which had public support uh, in the 90 percent range, polling showed at the time. They had support from groups across the political spectrum. Uh, they got in the Senate the support of 55 senators, a healthy majority of both parties. Uh, but the filibuster killed this bill. Uh, by raising the threshold to 60 votes. And so the United States government went on record with no policy response whatsoever uh, to this massacre, and the same has continued true through subsequent shootings. So the filibuster is not something that, that benefits both sides evenly. It is something that continues to make it impossible for our federal government to uh, come up with reasonable middle-of-the-road policy solutions uh, to even the biggest challenges that we face today. It's such a sobering example, as you point out. Uh, at that time, this was a Quinnipiac poll that you pointed to that said nine in 10 Americans actually supported this. And yet, this is legislation that was not able uh, to move forward. Um, so, Adam, in 2013, your former boss, Democratic Senator Harry Reid, spearheaded a change to the Senate rules that eliminated the filibuster for most presidential nominations. How did that end up hurting Democrats down the road? Well, I would argue that it didn't for a couple of reasons. Uh, the 
benefit that we got as Democrats from that change was the ability to confirm a bunch of Obama justices who would not have been confirmed if we hadn't done this change. At the time we made the change, President Obama was on track to get the fewest judges confirmed of any recent president in recent history. Uh, after the change, Senate Democrats were able to confirm uh, a lot of Obama judges, uh, bringing him on par by the time he left office with, with previous presidents. So if we hadn't made the change, there would have been fewer Obama justices from a Democrat's perspective on the courts today serving lifetime appointments. That would have meant more vacancies for Mitch McConnell and Trump to fill. And then I would argue that if we had not done that change, not only would those vacancies still be open, uh, Mitch McConnell, as soon as it was to his advantage, would have uh, gone nuclear himself in the term of art that's used to describe the rules change uh, and gotten rid of the filibuster, thus allowing Republicans to fill those seats that had been left open. So, you know, I, I uh, there's a variety of opinions on this among Democrats. Some Democrats uh, have experienced expressed regret. Uh, but I would also point to the Senate today, which is divided 50-50, uh, and say that you know Vice President Biden's cabinet nominees and judicial uh, nominees uh, would not be able to clear 60 votes in this closely divided Senate. I think it's a good thing that that majority is down to a simple majority of 50-51 votes uh, so that Biden can actually get his nominees confirmed. So, you know, these, these changes, uh, they, they have some blowback. Uh, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth in American politics. That's that's part of the uh, uh, comes with the territory. Uh, but I think on balance, Democrats came out ahead on that change uh, and especially will come out on balance if they follow through and now go further with rules of form to enact to allow President Biden to actually enact his agenda uh, instead of having it be blocked with Republicans uh, as they seem to be gearing up to do. Yeah, so tell us more about this uh, push by Democrats currently to reform this and what stands in the way of that happening? Yes. So the idea is uh, getting rid of the 60 vote threshold. And so uh, when, when people talk about the filibuster, I think they often think of Jimmy Stewart uh, holding the floor and Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you know, prolonged speeches to delay a bill. What's different about the Senate today is that no longer happens. What we have is the emergence of something that we call the silent filibuster, where no one has to speak, uh, no one has to explain themselves, there's no accountability, uh, and all they have to do is make a phone call or send an email to what's called the cloakroom, which is sort of the nerve center uh, just off the floor. It's literally a, a room where people used to hang cloaks. Um, and that email raises the threshold on passage for any bill to a supermajority. Uh, that enables the party out of power to block the bill, making the party in power look bad, and then they ride that voter discontent to, to political uh, victory in the upcoming midterms. Uh, what, what progressives want to do is get rid of that 60 vote threshold. I think a lot of the reform proposals on the table would contemplate restoring the talking filibuster, uh, having people actually have to go to the floor and debate and explain to the public why they oppose a, a bill that they're choosing to block. Uh, and that would be much more in line with what the framers intended. The framers intended the Senate to be, uh, the quote is often used, the, the world's greatest deliberative body. Right now, there's no deliberation. There's no debate. Uh, senators have, have an easy time blocking anything that comes before uh, the body, and that grinds the gears of government to a halt. Uh, so I, I would certainly be in favor of something like that, uh, restoring sort of the more traditional version of the Senate. Uh, but then actually the gears of government start turning. Uh, people are able to pass things again. I think if you're someone who is hoping for a flourishing of bipartisanship, uh, the way to re revive that is to actually you know, have bills uh, be moving through the system to have people be back in the business of legislating. Uh, and so, you know, that is sort of what progressives are pushing for. The reason they want to see it is because it seems likely that Republicans uh, are going to block President Biden in the 50-50 Senate. He will need at least 10 Republican votes for most of what he wants to do. Uh, and, you know, maybe there's a, a break in the fever and Republicans decide to give him those 10 votes with some frequency. Uh, I tend to believe that won't happen on any regular basis. So by pursuing this kind of reform and restoring something like the talking filibuster, uh, Biden would both sort of return to some of the traditions of the Senate uh, and be able to pass his agenda. Yeah, at this moment, though, it does seem like bipartisanship is oh so far away. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Adam Gentleson, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to tell us about your book. It's a really interesting concept. We'll continue to watch if that debate moves forward. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me.